So today, um, I have the privilege of being here. Um, and as I was thinking about my childhood, because again, it's children's church, um, I was thinking about how, as a kid, I loved lots of things. One of the things I loved was stories. My dad was and still is the best storyteller. Um, you know, you ask him about like the fish he caught and the fish is like this big, right? So he would always tell me stories of adventures he'd go on. Um, he, had, he was one of four boys. So he always had lots of adventures. My favorite ones were the ones where he was getting into mischief, like shooting a beehive with a BB gun, or maybe throwing a cherry bomb down a toilet and flushing it at school. So I always heard lots of really, really good stories. Um, I also loved when my girls were little, I did not ask them permission for this, but one thing I loved is when my girls were little, not only would we read stories, but we'd even kind of act stories out. So one of the favorite things we would do was called dragon and princess. So my husband John was always a dragon, and somehow I was the knight. I was the hero. And uh, Genevieve was usually the princess, and JC would alternate between princess or baby dragon. And so in the story, you know, John would, of course, like, try and attack the princess and tickle her and, like, bring her into his den, which was just a massive blanket. Right? And so I was supposed to be the hero, and I'm going to save the princess, but 98% of the time, I was dragged into the den, and I was tickled too. But it was fun, because not only was this a fun game and a fun story, but sometimes we'd change characters. So sometimes John would be the hero, he would be the knight, and I would be the dragon. And so it was just really fun to be a different character. So when we listen to stories as kids, sometimes I think we can put, even as adults, We'll put ourselves into that story. And I think it's really fun, right? You listen to these stories, and now you are the hero. Sometimes, none of us want to be the victim in the story, but we're always the hero, right? So now we come to the story of what I'm going to talk about today, which is the Good Samaritan. And Jesus is by far the best storyteller I've ever read, okay? But I can't imagine hearing a story from the mouth of Jesus. I mean, we know that children would flock to him. Children would want to be there and listen to his story. So I just think what a magnetic, dynamic speaker he must have been, right? So here we have the story of the Good Samaritan, okay? So we have the story, and we're going to read it. So what we're going to do is, kids, I want all of you to grab a Bible that's sitting in front of you. And I know we don't look up verses in the Bible enough. Okay, so parents help the kids. We are going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan that can be found in Luke. Okay, so kiddos, we're going to look up Luke 10, verse 25 to 37. So Old Testament is before Jesus. New Testament is where Jesus is born and Jesus is life. So we, the story is by Jesus, so we know it has to be New Testament. Okay, so the back half of the Bible, we're looking at Luke 10 verse 25 to 37 and I'm gonna have my friend Ava read this so if you haven't found it that's okay Ava's gonna read it you ready hold and behold a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying teacher what shall I do to inherit eternal life and he said to him what is written in the law what does it read to you and he answered you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. But wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho and he encountered robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by coincidence, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three men do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed compassion to him. 
And then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Very good. So we have the story that, I mean, who here has heard this story before? Every one of us. Who here has heard it 10 times? Who here has heard it 100 times? Right? We're going to hear it 101 times today. So the point is, we hear this story. Okay? We all know the story. Even people who don't go to church know this story. There's even rules of Good Samaritan laws, right? So everyone has heard of the Good Samaritan. So we just take the story and just say, oh, we need to be nice. We need to help people go and do the same. And we move on and we feel like we've learned the story. We feel like we've heard it a hundred times and there's nothing more to learn from it. But what I think is interesting is all of us have heard the story from the perspective of the lawyer right? Because that's where the context of this is. It's a lawyer who came to Jesus and said, you know, how do I get eternal life? Jesus, we know, is incredibly smart. He can tell the future. He knows the past. Jesus knew this guy was trying to dupe him, right? So his answer was uh, what the Jews call the Shema. So it's actually a prayer that they recite and it's basically taking the Ten Commandments. We all believe in the Ten Commandments. So the first four commandments are all about loving and honoring God, and the last six are all about how we love and honor and respect other people. So there he clumps it together, and he says, love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you're correct, which he should be correct because he's a lawyer. He's not a lawyer that we know of as lawyers, but he is a lawyer in the law of Moses meaning he knows the law of Moses better than anyone else because that's his job. We also know, just as a Jew, this is something that, again, they pray twice a day. They, they all believe this. So it's interesting that he says to Jesus, so how do I get eternal life? No, he knows the answer. He's trying to get Jesus in trouble because we know about Jesus, right? So kids... What does John 3.16 say? Can you guys repeat it with me? John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So the lawyer thinks, go and do the same, follow all the Ten Commandments, but Jesus says believe in me and have eternal life. So if that was us, if we were the lawyer, I'd walk away sad. Because, raise your hand, who has followed all ten commandments? All the time. Well, that means we don't have eternal life. So again, being the lawyer, that and he did. To justify himself, that's what it said. He heard this. He, Jesus said, oh, you're right. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Love your neighbor. And he's thinking, oh, well, you know, I hate Samaritans, so Jesus, who's my neighbor? Thinking, oh, Samaritans don't count, right? When I ask my kids to do their chores, hey, go do your chores. And they're like, which chores do you want me to do? No, they know what chores to do. They're just trying to kind of weasel out of it. And so it's the same thing. This lawyer is literally saying, well, which, who's my neighbor? He doesn't want to love Samaritans. We know this too because at the very end of the story, when Jesus says, um, who is the one that acted like a neighbor? He couldn't even say the Samaritan. He literally said the one that was helpful. Okay? So one thing we realize from like this lawyer's perspective, we realize he's a little arrogant. He's trying to get Jesus in trouble, which we know Jesus is too smart for that. So Jesus said, you're correct. He didn't want to say, I'm the way, the truth, and life, because his ministry is not over. He's not ready to die yet, right? We see this many times where he's like, don't tell somebody about that miracle, right? He's, he's just not ready for people to know. So here we are in this place where this lawyer is, again, being arrogant, okay? Also, when we look at this story, because, again, we keep putting ourselves in the place of the lawyer, right, thinking we're the hero of this story, I don't know about you guys, but we've already said none of us have followed all the Ten Commandments, right? And we know that 
Jews and Samaritans hated each other. We also know that's breaking one of the Ten Commandments when it talks about thou shalt not kill. We know that hating someone in our heart is actually just as bad as murder. That's what it says in the Bible. So we know that we have all broken the Ten Commandments. And I know we're all good little Christians and we don't hate people. At the same time, I think if we really looked into our hearts a little more seriously, I think we'd realize that we're lying to ourselves. I think we all have something, and I hate using the word hate, but there's something we hate. It might be one person. It might be a group of people. It might be a philosophy. There's something in us that we don't like, and we think that we don't have to be kind to that group of people. Okay? For example, in the story, it talks about them being enemies. Right? So the last person you would think to help this Jewish man would be a Samaritan. Okay? So this Samaritan comes along, and he, first of all, takes care of him. Right? And it says when he takes him to the inn, he pays two denarii to take care of him at the inn. Well, if you're looking back in Bible times, what two denarii is worth, two denarii is considered two days of wages. Okay? So today, kids, if you worked at Chick-fil-A, Okay? You could get $20 an hour. Let's say you work eight hours. <laughs> I'm saying no, don't want to work. <laughs> um, eight hours, two days, that's $320. Okay? Who here has ever given $320 to someone they cannot stand? Or maybe donated it to a group you do not support? None of us. Okay? Let's look at it a little differently. So back then, two denarii was two days' wages. With two denarii, he was able to take this man to an inn, and he was able to stay there for a couple months, actually two to three weeks if food was included. Talk about inflation, right? Now, if you were to stay in a hotel today, average cost around here is about $150 a night. Okay, so again, if you're going to make $160 at Chick-fil-A and 150 of that is one night stay, again, if we're talking about a couple weeks stay in an inn, we're talking way more than two days' pay. So again, I know I am not a good Samaritan. I know I do not love the way Jesus wants me to love. Okay, so you guys kind of agreeing with me that like, yeah, we're not a good Samaritan? There is no way that I can be that loving. So, since we've learned this story as us being the Good Samaritan, us being the hero of the story, what if we're just the wrong character? Maybe we need to do a little character switch. We want to be the hero of the story, but I think we're realizing we're not the hero of the story. So who else could we be? Well, first of all, Jesus is kind of the hero of every story. So what if Jesus is the Good Samaritan? Does that make sense? We call him the good father. We call him the good shepherd. And don't you think he's the good Samaritan? So let's think about that, right? So if we think about uh, John, excuse me, Romans 5, verse 10. Okay, Romans 5, verse 10. You guys remember what that says? That says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This is saying that we're literally the enemies of God, but he died for us anyway. That means that our God is so holy, 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 perfect, and we are so sinful that it didn't matter. That God loved us so much that while we were his enemy, while we were sinful enemies of God, he died for us. Well, does that fit with the story? That there's the Samaritan and the Jew and their enemies, but he still helps him? Did you guys notice in the story, do you notice what the Samaritan used to clean up the wounds of the Jew that was beaten up? Do you guys remember that it said he, the, that the Samaritan used oil and wine? We've heard that throughout the Bible, right? Oil is always to represent the Holy Spirit. And wine, we know at the Last Supper, Jesus said, I pour this out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. So now this is really sounding like Jesus, isn't it? Someone that he can unconditionally love his enemies, someone that pours the Holy Spirit on them, and someone that dies for them. 
right? I'm thinking Jesus is the good Samaritan. So if Jesus is the good Samaritan, and it says we are the enemy, that probably means that we're that Jew that got beat up and laying on a street. Like I said before, none of us want to be the victim in a story. We always want to be the hero. But when we read this and we think about and think honestly about our lives, we really are. We really are that broken person who's been beaten up. Some people can absolutely easily identify with that character. Some people, they are going through some hard stuff right now some really hard stuff, and they feel like life is punching them in the face, right? So they do feel like this. They feel beaten down. They feel uh, low. They're in a low place, okay? Some of us can identify with that. Some of us are high on life. Life is good. Life is amazing, right? But I think the things we need to remember two things. One, when we feel like that, when we feel like we've been kicked down, knocked down, even that Jew, as he was laying there on the street, two Jewish men walked by him, right? The Levi and the priest. These are two people that by nationality and by profession were supposed to stop and help that Samaritan, and they didn't. So sometimes when you feel kicked down and you feel the people that should be helping you don't help you, it's okay, okay? Because Jesus, because people are not our savior. No one is going to save us. Jesus saves us. So when you feel that you're knocked down, don't give up. Jesus is still walking by. He sees you. Okay? So Jesus will help you. But those that think that they're not knocked down, they're not kicked down, not recognizing that we're all sinful, and we feel like we can't identify with this character, what I think we need to realize too is that we need Jesus just as much on our worst day as we need Jesus on our best day. Because if we keep thinking that we don't need Jesus because life is good, well, we're going to find ourselves in that situation where that beaten down, trodden on person. Okay? The other thing that makes me think that the Good Samaritan is Jesus is remember how he said to the innkeeper, here's money, but I'll be back and I will pay you what you have given. We all know Jesus is coming back. We all know Jesus has been here, right? Jesus has absolutely been here. He's paid the price to take care of us, and Jesus will be back, okay? So I absolutely think that we need to rethink who we are in the story. So I think God's perspective, Jesus' perspective on this, was he wants us to realize he is the Savior, and we need a Savior. But that doesn't get, off, get us off the hook. Okay, that does not mean that we get to be like, oh, that's Jesus' job to save people. I think there's another character in the story that we should be like. Do you guys remember which character that would be? The innkeeper, right? The innkeeper tended to this person. It did not talk about what nationality they are because it doesn't matter. Our job is to take care of people. I know I've had this happen. I'm sure you guys have had this happen too. And if you hadn't, pay more attention. All the time, God is dropping people in your life that he wants you to take care of. Whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, there are people who need to know Jesus, and we are the right people to show them Jesus. Agreed? Okay, so... In conclusion, I'm really hoping that as we read through all of the parables, uh, the parables are amazing stories, right? Surface level, they're amazing stories, and Jesus always has a deeper meaning. One of the other things that I didn't mention was when you look at the story, let's get a little bit more perspective. We also know that we're never supposed to just take something out of context. So when we look at the story in context, right, sometimes we just read the story of the Good Samaritan, sometimes we add the lawyer part before. But the other thing that we don't read is if we actually go just a couple verses before. So the story we read start with verse 25. But if we go back to verse 21 and actually look at what the beginning of verse or chapter 10 talks about, it actually talks about how at this point in time, Jesus now had 70 disciples that he sent out. Okay? He said, don't bring money, don't bring clothes, don't bring food. I am sending you out into the wolves and I need you to preach in my name. Okay, so Jesus sends them out. Now they're all coming back. Jesus is actually out 
preaching, he's standing there preaching, and his disciples come back to them, to Jesus, and they are so excited. They're so excited. They're like, Jesus, we don't believe this. We healed people. We cast out demons. We did all these things in your name. This is incredible. And Jesus looks to heaven, and he says, Oh, praise you, my Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for all this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills reveals to him. Then he turns to his disciples and says, in private, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see and did not see them, and hear the things which you hear and did not hear. And then the lawyer stood up. Okay? So if we put this completely in context, we're literally hearing Jesus say, Disciples, I am so proud of you. You have asked for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given you discernment, and you are realizing what is of God and what is not of God, and now he tells the story, okay? This also is not the first time that Jesus has told a story that we needed discernment on, right? Do you remember the story of the sower and the seed? And at the end, the disciples were like, hey, Jesus, what are you talking about? Okay, it was an amazing story with a lot of deeper, uh, deeper information. And so this is the same thing. So I think this is the perspective that we need to remember whenever we're going through the Bible, and especially when we're reading the stories, is we can't just take it at surface level. We can't always think that we are the hero, right? We have to always have this perspective that every single story, Old Testament, New Testament, always points back to Jesus, okay? So as we leave today, I want us to remember how good and amazing and loving and merciful our God is because we are his enemies and he still died for us okay and because of his love and his mercy we are to go and do the same amen